sense of negotiation is I made a counter offer. Now, does that mean I made a counter offer? Does that mean I have an agreement with it? No, right? Why? Because an agreement by definition means the offer or counter offer has to be accepted by the other party. So he accepts it, let us say. And what is the consideration in this case? 3,000 rupees. Okay. So now, if I were to, let's say the shopkeeper, I really negotiated hard with the shopkeeper and I asked him to give it to me for a buck. Would that be valid consideration? Yes. Why? Yes. Good. So it's a valid consideration. There is money. I have given him a buck. Now suppose it were an offer, free. First 10 customers in my store will get a dress of their choice for free. Is that a valid agreement? There is no consideration. Zero. Why? Okay. You are right, but in this particular case, it is not a contract. It's a gift. Gift is also a form of contract. The general rule of contract is if there is no consideration, it is an invalid contract. But so if you were to take up an employment, sign an employment contract, which says it's employment, it gives you your duties, all that, and there is no salary, it is void. The contract is void. So you must understand the legality behind it. So I have put it up, it's called a it's called a Nudum Pactum agreement. If there is zero consideration, there are exceptions to Nudum Pactum, uh, which we don't have to worry about. I gave you an example of uh, a gift. Now the next one, uh, this is a friendly you know, guy uh, across the street, a palm guy. Now I go there uh, once in a while uh, to buy palm and I also go there once in a while to buy ganja. I pay him money, he keeps ganja, he gives me, sends me ganja. Is that a valid argument? I buy it. Why? Okay, any other any other answers? It is not a valid contract. The difference between a contract and an agreement is very, very important. One can argue that I have an agreement with him. Now, suppose I paid him 5,000 for the next stash of Gaja and he defaults. As far as my agreement is concerned, you know, forget the fact for a moment that it is unlawful. Get that out of your mind. Or for that matter, it's a, I mean, I can't think of a lawful case. Can I enforce it in a court of law? I can't. I'll give you a classic example. A house wants to be rented. You know, somebody is looking to rent a house. Person comes in, rents it. Run, tries to run a brothel. It's unlawful. Suppose the owner were to look to evict the person, despite having an agreement, despite having a contract, despite having a rental agreement, all that. I cannot go to a court and sue the landlord simply because the activity for which I entered into the contract was unlawful. So the important thing to be remembered is the object has to be lawful. Next, you all know who she is? Deepika, right? Somehow I got home with Deepika's cell number. I sent her the SMS. Why SMS? Uh, WhatsApp message? Because I know she has read my message, right? I get, you know, double ticks. So I tell her, you know, Sunday, wherever, Mandri Mall or UB City or wherever, at this restaurant, dinner, 7.30, uh, please come there, you must come, I'll be waiting for you. Now, I remember I talked about an offer? Is that a valid offer? From a contract, 
forward slash agreement perspective. Right? <laughs> so, so, so basically, social contracts are beyond the purview of business contracts. Social. Social. It's a statement. It's a social uh, engagement kind of thing. So if I, it's an invitation. So such invitations are not considered to be a contract. Number one. Now I, you know, become a little smart and I say, uh, okay, you know, day after tomorrow's evening, 7:30, UBC dinner. You have to say, I will, you know, if by tomorrow evening you don't confirm, I will assume it is confirmed. And she doesn't confirm, she doesn't reply. Is that valid? I think uh, probably law requests the nature of this one. So this kind of thing is social. So no, social, forget the fact that it is social. I'm just trying to get a point across. So subsequently, if you remember these five or six or whatever cases that I'm going to talk about, you will know exactly what is a contract, what is an agreement. So even in your business, you will know how to look at contracts from a legal perspective. Most of the time, I know I have run businesses in the US, I have run businesses in India. The main difference between US and India running businesses, especially startups, <coughs> is cash flows. Here, unfortunately for us, our interest rates are very high. Banks don't lend us money without some collateral. Two, three, customers don't pay us. Final 10% never comes out. Any time, any customer, I mean those in software will know this very well. Any time a customer contract has final 10% after acceptance, that acceptance will never happen. Still companies go in and sign the contract and they write off the 10%, 5%, whatever. You all know it, especially those in software. So the reason is you need to understand all this to know that the only way from a contract standpoint in a business, you can improve your cash flows, you can improve your the way in which you do business is by making sure that you, your contracts are just about perfect, as good as you can get, uh, as good as you can go. So in this case, there, you know, the key thing in any contract is, here of course I did uh, take the example of Deepika Padukone. Suppose I were to send this to a customer saying I am looking to sell this, this is my offer. If you don't confirm by tomorrow, I will assume you want it and I will ship it. Invalid. Because acceptance means clear. The first one is a statement. Statement can't, you know, you can't impose the burden of, silence can't be acceptance. It has to be explicit. That's the point. So I can't say if you don't reply by tomorrow, I will assume you want it and I will ship it and then expect him to pay. He's under no obligation to pay. This happens in business. People still, I've seen it in India, writing these kind of names and shipping it and then sitting in front of, you know, at the doorstep of the client looking to collect money, which under law, he's under no obligation to pay. Now, another bank heist, these guys going there, with guns in their hands and say, the money, give me the money. So the cashier hands over the money. And they go and then they get arrested by the cops and the, the cops ask, no, we just asked for the money and they gave us the money. Is that bad? Obviously not. Why? Because consent has to be free. There can't be undue pressure, there can't be undue influence, no fraud, no deception, there are all these angles that come into the picture. Now, final, final maybe, final or maybe there's one more. Car dealership of BMW, now this lady wants to buy a car and she says, my father will pay for it. Now the salesman believes her, calls up the father, father says, yeah sure I'll pay, tomorrow is a birthday, so I want to give this to her. So she signs the contract because it's her car. The guy goes to collect money from the father. Can he enforce it? Because it's only four conversation. Right? Four conversation, right? Now suppose I were to say that this lady goes in there, no talk of father. 
So I want to buy the car and the science, everything, drives away with the car giving him a check. The check bounces and he gets to know that she is a 17 year old. What happens to the contract? She has given a check, she had a bank account, a joint account. Minors can have joint accounts. So is it a valid contract? She can decide to not exclude it. No, in this case, she signed, he is, he looked at her, she looks like an adult. How should this guy know she is 17 years old? So the point is, 17 year old, minor, it's not a valid contract. So only an adult can enter into a valid contract. Anytime you, uh, legal guardian, you know the person has to be represented by a legal guardian who will, so competence to contract or com the persons involved need to be competent to enter into a contract. Extremely important. Normally, you know, coming to a competent contract. Absolutely. You know, the problem is, you know, in, in the principal agent context, that is extremely important in business laws. A company, because most business happens enterprise to enterprise. Now, in the enterprise to enterprise context, how will you as a seller get to know that the person that you are interacting with is authorized to buy from you? How do you mean B2B? B2B context. Suppose let's say I am from one company, I am a salesman, you are a purchase manager. How do I know you sign a purchase order? How do I know you have the authority to sign it? What if the company were to say, look, he was never authorized to sign it, still uh, he signed the purchase so, order, so he's. Sometimes I have seen authorized signatory, we don't know. He is authorized signatory or not. So, in, that, in such a scenario, what happens? So, if the buyer, you are the buyer, you are company, you are the purchase manager, so your company ends up saying, or let's say the general manager tells me when I go to collect money, what? You supply the goods, I never ordered the goods, we never wanted it. The purchase manager, uh, he committed a blunder, it's acted. You are not responsible, you are not going to pay. What happens? No, it's litigation, but who do you think is that stand rightful of the company? Is that stand right, correct? Trying to sell arms to our friendly neighbors. 
He got the bar. He says that money gets stuck. What happens? Loss. Now there are two ways of looking at it. The photo of course shows AK forty sevens or whatever. So let's say those are banned goods. So you can't. No private party can buy or sell those goods. So then I understand. Suppose this had been Athens. Then what? Gone. So, as per regular normal international trade, uh, supply of arms? Yeah, arms it is needed. Which one say? True, 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 true. See, but arms and ammunition, possession of arms and ammunition in India is a crime. Firearms. So, so that's illegal, unlawful. So if, if you come to that earlier one, Ganja example that I gave you, so unlawful. So forget that there is a weapon. So apples. There is normal trade between Pakistan and India that goes on. Valid? Now this guy has a purchase order from his counterpart in Islamabad or wherever. And he ships those apples. Okay? Now, the shipment has reached the buyer. India declares war against Pakistan and his payment doesn't come through. What happens? He wants to sue the supplier in a Pakistani court. Why? Because the supplier is there. I mean, he can sue him in uh, India, but he's not going to get his money back. So what happens? So which means if India has declared war, Pakistan obviously is at war with India. Pakistan has also declared war. What happens? So in this particular case, you know, the money is gone for good. The reason being, there are certain contracts that are expressly declared void to entering into a contract with an enemy nation. Because when it is war, it's an enemy nation. It is null and void at initial. So the point is, I mean, uh, right now I guess we are on some kind of friendly terms with Pakistan, but if ever Pakistan were to be declared uh, enemy country, please don't do business with them. Because China relationship takes quite See, until such time hostilities don't start, uh, you're, I think you're okay. Because you, you can open NCs and do all that, make sure that your money comes out and this bank basically vouches that surety. But otherwise, it's very, very high risk. So, so the point is, any enemy nation doing business itself is void. You're not supposed to enter into a business relationship with an enemy nation. That's the bottom. There are enough number of international cases on this, all dating back to the World War One, World War Two days, wherein it's been held. So, essentially, if you were to look at it, criteria for a valid contract, we start with the agreement and the agreement is an offer plus an acceptance plus consideration. Forget, you know, zero consideration also, some kinds of contracts are considered to be valid. Free consent is important. So, agreement plus these four things would make it enforceable in a court of law. That's the basic idea. Free consent, parties competent to contract, we went through each of those cases. If you remember those five or six whatever cases, you will know lawful objects not expressly declared void. You need to know all this. That, that in this party is competent to contract, there are also several things like you can't enter into a contract with a mentally deranged person. All those things are there which is, you know, pretty standard, you can understand. But these are the four cases that I covered earlier in those cases, but there are two more which are extremely important. Now under statute, under the law, there are certain kinds of contracts which necessarily
necessarily need to be put in writing. You know, I go buy a shirt, there is no written contract. It's all verbal. It's, so if the shopkeeper knows me well enough, I just call him and tell him, you know, that white shirt, uh, you know, just send it. He will send it, he will collect money. For that matter, Flipkart, when I purchase a book, I pay him on cash and delivery. Right? But, there of course, in Flipkart's case, there is some trade. You know, there is a documentary written claim, but anyway, there are many deals that happen, contracts that exist, uh, which are completely verbal, except like memorandum of association. It is not an enforceable contract. You cannot, if let's say uh, you start a private limited company and uh, the other directors, you know, your other associates, business associates, if you run into some problems with them. You can't take them to court if there is no memorandum of association in a written form. Trust, sale deed for removable property, it has to be necessarily in writing by statute, by law. Law dictates that. And sale deed needs to be in writing. Guess what? In case of removable property, any property with value <coughs> of more than 100 rupees, 100 rupees, that's all has to be written and it also needs to be registered. Under the Registration Act, witnesses are a must. So if you are getting the contract registered, it could be a lease, lease agreement. If you are getting it registered, if witnesses are not there, first of all, the sub is not going to register it without witnesses. But, so these are the six <coughs> essential, extremely essential criteria for an agreement to be a valid contract and be en enforceable in a court of law. So I thought I'd just introduce you to the basics of contract law. Now, when I spoke to Vish, uh, you know, there was a little bit of, so basically I understand uh, you know, some of you he has a course content that he has worked out, but uh, the sense that I got was not everybody is so convinced about the importance of loss. Now, I don't know if that is true or what your thoughts are. So, he wanted me to do a one session wherein I just expose him to some of the nuances of loss based on which you can take a call, a judgment call, of how much of uh, time to devote to business law. So again, like I said, you know, I had earlier, way back there, I had listed them down, some of the most important ones. Corporate company law, partnership laws, labor laws, depending on, you know, so I, maybe you can talk to him and uh, see what best works for you and we will see how to Any Any questions? Memorandum of understanding is something that you enter into before uh, making it, it's like an agreement, let's put it that way. It's an initial expression of interest. You have a certain understanding. That doesn't mean I have entered into a contractual relationship. Contractual relationship is memorandum of association, MOA. Then it is formalized. Remember, memorandum of understanding could be at a very high level. I am entering into this understanding, you and I, we want to do this business, but we have still not worked out the details. The details will follow subsequently uh, in a memorandum of uh, association. You need to be context. Uh, also, also, just to add, sorry, I will come to you in a minute. Also to add, an MOU is generally in a business setting intercorporate yeah. between two companies. Memorandum of association is to form a company. There is also that uh, distinction. So, uh, an agreement is an enforceable contract. An understanding, you know, you can, I can have a memorandum of understanding with you and tomorrow I will violate it. Yeah, sure, not a problem. Because we have still not seriously entered into a business. You know, understanding is an expression of interest. But from that, uh, those of you who sold in India with no letter of intent. You know, if the customer, before a customer gives you a purchase order, you try to get a letter of intent. 
So it's kind of like a letter of intent. We have this understanding, you will work towards this, I will work towards this, and then we will work out the details. Yamur is generally that SEZs are happened, so people are coming. Right, right. Karnataka government enters into a memorandum of understanding, not binding at all. They will say within six months we will give you all licenses, all approvals. It may take 60 years, you can't do anything. So, and also the from the post perspective, the business to business perspective, like how to do contracts with renters, suppliers, also the service related contracts. Sure. No, the key thing is uh, until and unless you feel, and unfortunately, and I've done business in India, I've done business in the US. Uh, in India, my experience, you know, when I was with HCL HP and uh, heading uh, sales and marketing for them, a lot of money to write off. 5 and 5% five for some flimsy reason, you keep chasing and chasing and chasing and eventually the cost of recovery becomes so high it becomes higher than the cost of write-off cost of write-off is the figure that the amount appears in your books but for a sales guy, instead of selling and picking up business elsewhere for him to go and get that final 2 lakhs or whatever, 50,000, 20,000 becomes so quite this right Incidentally, what I didn't cover here in this, and I attach a lot of importance to this, alternate dispute resolution. If you are intelligent enough, if you know the law, you can make sure that every penny comes across. The devil lies in the detail. The way all businesses work, they have a standard template, terms and conditions. Right? Make sure that terms and conditions protects your interest 100%. Now, if the customer or the whosoever is comes to you asking for a deviation, then think about it. Then look at you know, what deviation he wants. Then if you understand the impact of that deviation on recovery of money, you will never have a problem. But if you have Problem with most, especially startups, and I know this, I have first hand experience. You know, we just started a company and we were desperate for survival. So every entrepreneur, you got your first contract, you just want to run with the contract. Forget the terms. You know, we trust our client and we know he's going to pay. If I do a good job, he will pay. Why will he not pay? Guess what? You know, you may be naive, you may be a nice human being who gives the benefit of doubt to the other person, but there are sharks out there, money will and they will also be very nice. It's not a cash flow problem with this. And like this you will sit on your money for nine months, ten months. I know I work with the uh, India Industries Association. Uh, interesting initiative I have with them. Again uh, through Karnataka government, the Indian Institute of Science. We are trying to identify, see all these companies, there are 6,000 of them, factories in Vinya area, and all of them are having similar problems. Tremendous competition from China, undercutting from China. Two, cash flows, why customers don't pay. Three, uh, money, banks don't lend money. So if you ask them, so what we are trying to do, looking at their plant and machinery, infrastructure, the facilities that they have, we are going to identify a product that they can easily manufacture for which patents have expired. <coughs> now the challenge here is not just identifying a patent expired product that the company can manufacture, but also making sure that there is a good enough market that exists for it. So, in a way, it is leveraging existing strengths 
to zoom in on something for which there is no IP. So, they all have the same story to tell that money, cash flow, sir, in one of the and there is a ripple effect. Employees don't get paid on time, they don't get salaries, you know, they squeeze employees, they squeeze their suppliers. It's a chain. It's a chain. So any other questions? From the most perspective, everything related to startup, including the MOUs and the registration and uh, your uh, initial contract of the investors, VCs. Okay. Sorry, I actually started off saying, trying to say something and then I got sidetracked talking about Kenya. Alternate dispute resolution. The most important uh, aspect of business is negotiations. And uh, China, the, the toughest negotiators are Chinese negotiators. I can give you any number of examples, aside many examples there from personal experiences. The reason for that is, the reason for why Chinese are such tough negotiators, it's because every Chinese student in high school has a mandatory course of negotiations. Now, where are we? I mean, some of us are good negotiators because we hail from business families, but not all of us are Gujaratis, maybe Marwadis. But what about every person in China is a tough negotiator? Why? Because they learn the art and science of negotiations. So it's really important. So that uh, is something that I forgot. But basically, I think uh, if you could uh, sit with uh, Vish and identify, I've given you the broad uh, heads. Factory may not be applicable here at all. You may, you may not have too much interest there. So you decide uh, that memorandum of understanding and association will come in on the corporate loss. Last uh, dealing with public sector companies or uh, on the private companies. See, public sector. Yeah. Government. I know, I answer. Government. See, government, let's assume for a moment that money doesn't talk in government. You know, you can bribe and you can get your money out, but that's not what we are looking at here. The thing with, and again from my own experience, if you have a government contract, whatever is there in letter, Forget spirit. If you comply with each of those conditions in the contract, in the terms and conditions, you will get your money. They won't stop. They will release your money. Not so in private. In private, they will nitpick, they will say, no, but you are supposed to supply this, no AC, the temperature that we are supposed to maintain is 21, is available, all those some nonsense they will come out with. And even large companies, I know of a French company in which I have invested. Uh, Dell, American company, 30 lakhs, no payment. The final 20% for a one and a half hour contract. Dell, finally, after one and a half years, they have said through series of emails, series of meetings, series of discussions, they said we will release 25 lakhs. Please don't ask for 5 lakhs. Don't even come to us. We've done our best. This is Dell. The same Dell in the US. 15 days you will make a check. Those who have lived in the US will know. Because that data goes to Dun and Bradstreet, it gives your credit rating. Even businesses like here we have ratings. Businesses also get rated on credit worthiness. Different uh, business environments. These more your minds exactly when a person really start coming to a lab to start straight because it's the same both, both are the same companies uh, and business is good even with the same contract same terms and conditions nobody looks into that payment flows everything will happen and uh, yeah, yeah as long as the demand and supply are there is a dependency or whatever it is but all of a sudden this comes at some point of time so what is that is that crisis are... See, there are, I, I get your point. See, there are two things that is at the heart of any contract or any business relationship. Two concepts. One is called caveat emptor. These are Latin uh, phrases. The other is caveat venditor.
caveat enter is basically buyer beware. If I am buying something from a supplier, the onus is on me to make sure that the goods are as per my needs. Once I receive the or as per what I had ordered, that's a duty on me. Once I receive the goods, accept it, then I can't say I won't pay because it's defective. Okay. From a vendor's perspective, there is also again caveat vendor. You have to make sure that your terms are something that you can honor. If not as a supplier, your money will get stuck. So these two concepts, if you are familiar, business downturn or no downturn, money flow will be there. You know, having said that, at the end of the day, some 20,000 gets stuck or 10,000 gets stuck, you will write it off. Because it's not worth knocking on the doorstep of a court to recover 10,000 because for just the first meeting, your lawyer will charge you 10 grand. So, but if it is substantial, so make sure that no small amount, so the moral of the story is small amounts like 10,000 after acceptance, 3 months, final 5, 2.5% after 3 months of successful operation. Never agree to Never agree to Things there are certain things like this. You must understand if somebody wants to pay you after 3 months of successful operation, he does not want to pay you. He's not going to pay you. At least, at least it will help you knowing contract law inside out will help you assess the risk behind the business a lot better. That is so, that two and a half percent, you make sure that I am entering into this contract, I know if I get the two and a half percent, I am lucky, if not, I will let it go. And when the contract line is so old, it's a mentally quality, it's some that old it is still we are following. No, it's a it's a pre-British, it's a British uh, uh, law. No, but it has been amended, it has been updated. You know, basically it is current. I mean, there is nothing in the contract act which is out of place or out of date. It is still uh, a decent enough. It's one of the acts which has very few, I mean, it's well settled in law, you know what you need to do, what the other person, other party needs to do, everything is very clear. So, I think we can fight in the IP. That is his uh, main forty, so we will have one more. My, my, as a, as a, okay, my ideas are corporate laws, so corporate obviously, because my past background, I, I'm a businessman, entrepreneur, so, corporate uh, laws, uh, corporate laws uh, also include contract, I mean, there is no escape there. Then intellectual property, immovable property, uh, these are my forms. And you know, there is no, in India, every advocate worth his salt will be put in the immovable property. If you are not, you are not an advocate at all. So, that is basically, you do say you don't, you have given a lot of, you have done, sure. should be your perspective. That can be the overall all you can take. And then fundamentally uh, what is the flow of the whole system? So like in a challenge cycle of recruitment, training, injection, evaluation, and evaluation. We are looking at a big system like codes are part of the Police is a part of law, correct? Then, what about the law agencies? How do they repeat them on day to day? Everybody is attached to law in a way. So many activities are coming at one point of time. Which are, where is the flow can be? See, the way, again, it's two arms, essential arms. How did we get it? How did the litigation start at it? What's the same plan? Basically, we can divide it into two parts, civil and criminal. Any civil dispute is between two parties. In case of a criminal offence committed, it is between the accused and the state. Why is the state get involved if there is a murder? Why is it that the state prosecutes the accused? 
It is because every criminal offense is considered to be an offense against society. If, if a fellow human being's life is taken off, murder, it has been taken off with a cruel loser, his society. Because a productive man, society has lost. He could have contributed to society. So that's the concept behind the government prosecuting the accused. In civil cases, it is between two parties because there is a dispute. It could be a contract, it could be some company related matter, whatever. There, again, the process starts with the lawyer's notice. So anytime as a businessman you receive a lawyer's notice, a summons? No, not a summons. That will follow later. A court uh, will also serve a notice. First, you will receive from the other party's lawyer, advocate. He will send you a note saying you are supposed to do this, you have not done it, so this is the money that you block, all that he will dis respond to that. And then it is up to him to actually file a suit in a court of law. <coughs> criminal matter, it starts with a FIR. Now, our criminal penal code, uh, penal uh, provisions, do allow for, suppose, there is, you know, the machinery, police machinery is completely with the, you know, let's say the accused and they are refusing to register the FIR. We hear that. So our uh, laws do provide for a magistrate accompanying to the file with the magistrate directly saying the concerned police authorities are not registering the FIR and the magistrate will take cognizance of it and direct the police authorities to investigate the matter. So we do have, on the criminal side and the civil side, the judiciary is fairly uh, uh, well organized that way, the system. But the problem is, it is not efficient and it is not effective. I remember earlier I said, we are over legislated, under litigated. We are under litigated because per capita litigation is very, very, very low. Still, the number of cases pending before the courts is very high because it goes on for a very long time, every case, and ideally we should perhaps have 10 times the number of courts, we don't. But still you mean are under litigated? We are still under litigated because you have to look at per capita. Okay. Per capita probably should be 0.1%, I don't know. It's very, very low. What will be the cost of litigation? Cost of litigation compares very favorably if you were to look at countries in the US. US is expensive. Even here these days, good lawyers are expensive. You don't know that. Or actual court, when we file a court fees. No, case. that court fees would be there, but court fees are not uh, exotic. You know, like, it depends. It depends on the case, uh, suit value. Uh, there is a schedule that is there. You will have to calculate it based on the value of the suit. Court fee gets decided based on how much you are suing for. For this 10,000, 5,000, uh, you know, you can very well forget. My perception is that some of the government I think that the majority of the So which means if 
there is a constant stream of droplets, then my whole schedule goes for a toss. This is reason number one. So every, I mean, in case of doctors, these days they will make you wait for 15 minutes, half hour. But I know in lawyer uh, offices, advocate offices, the average wait time would be anywhere from half hour to one hour. Minimum is half hour, I would say. Minimum. So one hour, two hour, common. The other reason for that is, when there is a hearing going on in the court, there is no knowing when it will be over. Suppose I tell you I'll meet you at four. If my hearing continues beyond four, I have no choice. Because I can't turn on my, if I'm in the midst of an argument, I can't turn my cell phone on and speak to you. It's content of court. So the phone has to be in silent mode. So guess what happens? You end up doing that. So there are these things. Lawyers, I know the successful lawyers are amongst the hardest working people that I have met. Successful, real veterans. The, the earliest that they go to bed is 1 in the morning. They are up at 5 or 6 and they are in the office at night. And these are lawyers who charge a bomb. I mean, you will keep uh, when I was in further discussions, we will focus more on the point of contract law, contract law, no? and then how to form a company. Sure. Most sure. of them are one day or other, they will form. In two CPDs, that really matters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, what I suggest is we have a high level idea of, you also have a high level of idea of what you want to be discussed. Yes. What I suggest you do is within a, allocate the time that you want to be spent on each of those topics. Yes. Because you want, uh, accordingly, see, because the, you know, even the most ridiculous, smallest act will have a 5,000 page book. If you are looking at the constitution, the, a good constitution commentary will have 20,000 pages minimum. I mean, multiple volumes. So that way it is so vast that until and unless you decide in terms of importance, uh, incorporation of a company is extremely vital. So I want this much time, even whatever allocate time is allocated, and we can work out the plan and uh, take that. Thank you. Sure. Uh, we'll just plug this out or? Yeah. Okay. Sure, 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 sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also I exchange my card. Uh, you can buy the It's just trading the sentence and have some conditions. Actually, mostly where uh, people get confused before accepting uh, No, actually, you know, you are right. But that, the way you phrase it, yeah. is so important that, uh, you know, you end up with problems if you don't do it right the first time. That's not
there is a court appointed mediation that happens. Mandated, it is mandated. So both parties have to come in and they negotiate, mediate. In fact, two days before the meeting, my lawyer asked me to remit 20,000 dollars. So I said, what for? So she said, I need to prepare for the mediation. So I said, no, I'm fine. So I went there, I argued my case on my own. The first question that the judge asked me is, you can represent yourself, but you can't represent the company. So I said, uh, no, then we will have to adjourn this meeting and uh, postpone it to a different date. So then she asked me, are, are you in a position to bind your company? So I said, yes, I am a majority stakeholder. It's my own company. So she went ahead, we went ahead, and I settled uh, out of court to the end. So, so I experienced it there, and that was when I decided I had a look. And then I came here, US, those of us who have been in the US, we know, all of a sudden the system there works. People comply with the law. You buy some site, some apartment, some property, you never get one. You know he is the owner and he is selling it to you, I am getting tight. Here it's a mess. And as luck would happen when I came from the US back to India, whatever property I bought, something or the other, there was some problem or the other. And that was when I decided, damn it, I will become an advocate myself and then let me see who is going to fool me. <laughs> So, before starting our interpretation, we found that we will do what I said, like us to study a law and so that nobody can fool us. Because in India, we have a lot of character and people will. We will take advantage of good days and uh, the good So, it's advantage to what you say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, law, like I said, uh, we underestimate uh, the importance of law in India. We just think, because we are not going to go to a court. The other